Hello, I'm Dr. Meltem Zaytanolu, or Dr. Zay, as my patients like to call me, and I'm here with my colleague um, and, uh, and mentor, Dr. Lou Phillipson, uh, head of the Kovler Diabetes Center. Welcome, Dr. Phillipson. Hi, thank you for doing this. We just wanted to uh, uh, share with our patients today uh, that we are all here with you in this unnerving time. We know that especially for the many of you out there who have diabetes and who, who we get to see and work with um, all the time, this is a pretty scary time. And so we kind of wanted to go over some of the questions that we've been hearing and that we've been thinking about for you. Um, and this will be hopefully a, a forum that, that you can continue to, to reach out and a reminder that we're here for you, even though you're not seeing us in the clinic. So Dr. Phillips, and I'm going to go ahead and get started and ask you a question today. Um, our patients with diabetes are really worried. Are they more likely than, than those who don't have diabetes to, to get infected with the COVID uh, virus? You know, it doesn't look like they're more likely to get infected. There is an issue with perhaps having more complications, and that may be related to other comorbidities. Certainly people with well-controlled type 1 diabetes, so far we don't think are at increased risk for catching it in the first place. Older people who may have other risk factors, and so those people we are more concerned about, and the message still is to stay home and don't mix as much as you can. So, so there, that, there's that thought that maybe if you've had diabetes for a longer period of time or if you have diabetes complications, things associated with diabetes like heart disease, that, that you may be at even higher risk. Is that, is that right? Well, I'm, I'm afraid so. I mean, having heart disease, having high blood pressure, uh, having an, a known coronary artery disease, it makes it harder to fight some of the issues that happen with any serious infection, whether it's flu or a bad cold, or now COVID-19. So we definitely want to protect those folks as much as we can, have people stay at home, have other folks go and, and shopping for you if possible. I know that several stores, certainly in the Hyde Park area, are having senior hours where seniors can go for an hour with reduced crowds. I mean, those things are potentially life-saving. Yes, absolutely. And so that brings us to another really good point where a lot of our patients are worried about their medications and, um, you know, that they're worried that, that in, this, in this pandemic that we're in, they're going to run out of their insulin or, or diabetes medications. Is there any concern that we should be having about that right now? I mean, the good news is that we're hearing over and over again is that the supply chains are intact, that there's no shortage of insulin, there's no shortage of any other really critical medicine specifically for diabetes. So uh, what we are doing is having access to my chart. I'm renewing uh, my patients' prescriptions you know, all hours of the day and night. I'm trying to have, we, we can have electronic access. It's really, it's one of the few maybe uh, silver linings to this cloud is that we can renew medicines from anywhere in the world really, even at home. So that as soon as I get an order from a pharmacy, uh, or through our nurses, if someone has access to my chart, I can instantly okay that prescription and they can have it within the hour. And we can do that with almost any pharmacy around the United States. So if people are listening to this who are our patients, I've done this for folks in Kentucky and Florida and Texas and Washington. So, uh, so I think the key is to stay in touch and don't wait until the end. Look at your prescriptions. Uh, be sure we, we sometimes do need a day or two if it's my chart to go ahead and do that. But the bottom line here is that the pipelines are intact, medicines are available, just be sure you have what you need. I can't stress that point enough. Um, you know, it's it's really important to stay ahead of, of your refills for our patients. Um, you know, this is a really good time to take stock. See, make sure that you have a couple of months ahead of you, ideally up to six months of refills. Give us a, a call. You, you know, in this time when we're trying to keep you all home, uh, mail, farm, mail order pharmacies is a really good way to do it. Most of the major pharmacies, CVS, Walgreens, our own D Cam Pharmacy at the University of Chicago are all doing mail order. The only thing is there, there is a little bit of a lag right now because of the de demand being so high. So, you know, the sooner that you can be proactive and ask for your refills ahead of time, the better chance we can do to get it for you in a very timely manner, but also get it delivered to you so you don't have to leave the, the house. That's right. Uh, I mean, so let me just add that, that um, you don't really need to have six months at home. I think what yes. you're saying is yes. that you want to look ahead and have renewals for six exactly. months. Very often, 
my patients don't realize that we typically renew medicines a year in advance. And so that means you can get your usually three month refills, refilled three or four times before that prescription has to be renewed. So you might wanna check that before you contact us because we do find sometimes there's a lot of what you might say is good churning. So pharmacies asking us for refills even though there are plenty of refills still available. So people don't have to worry about that so much. If you're concerned, then by all means, send us a MyChart note, send us an email, and we can check and just get back to you and say, you're cool, we've got all the refills in, in, in the system, and I can even very easily send a receipt to you to show you that the pharmacy has in fact received that electronic request. So there's a lot we can do in real time. These are all things I do all the time, but especially in the last few days. Absolutely. So in addition to medications, one of the other most important things that we can be doing right now is making sure we're more vigilant than ever about checking our blood sugars, whether we're doing that by the traditional older finger stick method or using our newer continuous glucose monitors. And so what are you recommending for our patients for that? Well, I think if you are still relying on checking your finger four times a day or less, it really depends on whether you're on insulin or some other drug that lowers your blood sugar. If you're not on a glyburide or sulfonylurea, if you're only taking metformin and certain other medicines that don't actually cause low blood sugar, you don't really have to test that often. It's good to just know what your blood sugar is and it will help you to watch your diet and make sure you're doing some kind of exercise, although not in crowds. If you are taking a medicine to lower your blood sugar, then it's great to check more often. So that's where we say checking before each meal and at bedtime, that can really help you get the sense of the patterns. Occasionally checking after a meal, I've recommended a couple of hours, um, just even a few times a week to see how high you're going, that can be very helpful. And then if you are taking insulin, then it depends on what kind of system you're on. If you're on insulin injections, again, to sometimes we have taught people to vary their dose of insulin depending both on the carbohydrates and on the blood sugar, in which case knowing your blood sugar is really critical to adjusting your insulin. And then if you're also doing a CGM, of which there are four different kinds on the market, we can help by sending you, if you don't have the information to download, <clears throat> our wonderful diabetes educators have provided us with information to remind you how to get us that data. So a lot of it can be done on, online, either from a phone or from your computer, so that we can see exactly what your blood sugar is over the last few weeks. And that is incredibly powerful. So if you don't have that information, if you're not already set up, again, a MyChart message to, from our patients will really help us get that information to you. So, so that's all very important. I have one example. Um, so this is a tough one, but I did have a patient go into DKA yesterday morning, diabetic ketoacidosis. Why? Not clear. She woke up in the middle of the night with vomiting. That's one of the signs of having too many ketones in your blood. But she wanted to tough it out. She thought she could beat it. She thought maybe the next sip of water she could hold down. And maybe the pump just came undone in the middle of the night. She certainly didn't have any fever, no cough, no viral symptoms. It was simply a question of having not enough insulin. So she was, uh, we sent her to the ER, they saw there were ketones, they gave her fluids, sugar and insulin, she was home the next day. So, so being proactive, knowing your blood sugar, having ketone strips, if you don't have them, we can provide you with ketone strips. If you're on insulin, that's a good thing to have. So that's a long answer that says, check according to your need. If you don't know, we're happy to remind you and keep in touch. So if you're checking according to what you were normally doing, if you're sick, if you're having viral symptoms, runny nose, low grade fever, you might wanna check a little bit extra. The American Diabetes Association is recommending that if you have uh, multiple blood sugars over 240, um, that you, you wanna be checking your ketones. And so those are all things you can be doing. Um, you know, many patients are worried that they are not able to come into the lab for their A1Cs, uh, you know, because this is considered, and in, in not all, but in, in some cases, not urgent. As you mentioned, having the continuous glucose data, now we can download your glucose meters if we set that up and estimate your average A1C. And so there's a lot we can do. And for those patients who don't have that and for who are doing uh, finger sticks, 
please write down your blood sugars and have those ready when we call you. And so we can do a lot to help you and see if we need to adjust your medications based on those, those um, numbers as Excellent well. Excellent points. Yes, I think you know many people still rely on A1C. I just love that point that you made. And I've been having a conversation with some of my colleagues around the country about how important A1C is right now. And I think there have really been two answers. One is that if, if you don't check your blood sugar that often, and you're even on just pills with type 2 diabetes, you might not know how you're doing without that A1C. And so for those people, having an A1C a few times a year you know, could still be a good idea. So we're trying to figure that out right now. If you know, delaying it a few weeks until things settle out a little bit is perfectly fine. Um, and for other people, having that CGM is actually better than the A1C. So totally agree with you. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. And any other thoughts or, or comments for our patients? Well, I think we're gonna do a series of these interviews. And so I, I think to, to help people um, get the information they need, I mean, there is a couple of things to say. One is that there is a ton of information. A lot of it is scary. And we also are scared. I think to be a little scared is human. And I think what we wanna do is persevere we want to be able to see how we are going to get through this. And one of it is by talking to each other, staying in touch, using phones, electronic communication, so that people hear your voice, reach out to your friends, reach out to us. We're happy to hear you. I think that sort of solidarity um, is as big a, a part of the battle as anything else. I also want to be sure that people know about some of the great websites, both the American Diabetes Association, diabetes.org, the JDRF for people with type 1, are maintaining excellent websites where there is a update information, especially for people with diabetes. There's some great messages from Tracy Brown, the CEO of the American Diabetes Association, and Bob Eckel, who's replaced me as being president of the American Diabetes Association for Medicine and Science. So I think people can take great comfort in seeing all the different people engaged and how seriously we're all taking this and how we're all reaching out and trying to be available for both advice and comfort. Thank you so much. That is indeed very comforting. And that's really the, the whole purpose of this video. I know that our patients are really scared. Um, they are not only feeling more vulnerable to, to uh, you know, hearing that they, they may have more complicated infection if they do get it, but also knowing that they can't see us. But we really want you to know that we all are very much here for you. We're going to do everything we can to keep you healthy and keep you out of the hospital. We don't want you to be afraid to go to the hospital if you really need it, but there's a lot we can do before you have to get there. And so as Dr. Phillipson said, we look forward to bringing you more of these sessions. We've been referring all of our patients for the most up-to-date information to the JDRF uh, website and the American Diabetes Association. And, and we are all here in this together um, through our fear and through our hope that, that we will get through this uh, and, and, and learn from it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and good luck, everyone, but stay in touch. Thank you.